apparently we will then go to one half of the Fantastics, an old friend of mine, a great professional wrestler and the current promoter of world classic professional big time wrestling in Ohio. Ladies and gentlemen, the fantastic Bobby Fulton. Wow, Jimmy, you got it exactly as I told you to do it. Now I will stay on the telephone pole as long as I want, you know, out on green acres outside of Chillicothe, Ohio, we have to climb the telephone pole every once in a while to get a chance to talk to y'all out there. <laughs> well, you know, in, in, in Columbus, they used to have hafts, Al hafts, half acre, but I understand yes, now yes. That they, they got Fulton's fucking flat uh, that, <laughs> that they run matches in. You, you are the promoter of world classic professional big time wrestling. Yes. It's world classic. They're professional big time wrestling. Yes, you got it exactly right. Jimmy, as a matter of fact, you came up here and helped me out, and the people can't wait for you to come back. But your only stipulation was, Bobby, I'm not getting back in that ring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will time. come and help you, but I will not get back in that ring. I'm still waiting on that. Now, listen. We did that superplex years ago, but I'm wanting you to put me on a flaming table and I want you to do a moonsault off of it onto me, but I move at the last minute. Well, but here's the thing. It'll take me so long to get to the top rope, but you'll have burnt the ashes and won't be able to move. <laughs> I'll no, be star broiled, Bobby every, Fulton. Every time you call me and ask me to come up and, and, and appear on one of your shows, there's some type of stipulation where I would get in the ring in some respect. And, and <laughs> I had my last singles match affair with you a number of years ago, and it's going to stay that way. I've retired after yes. wrestling you. About five times, I, I said, "Okay." After that, that uh, wrestle reunion thing where it was rock and roll and you and Tommy against me yes. and all three members of Midnight Express, I actually sold my tights and swore and, and never and Bobby again. Heenan, and Bobby and, and, Heenan was our manager. Yes, and Bobby managed you guys, and and, and so I said, I sold my tights. I said, "I'll never wrestle again." And then the chance to work in Spartanburg is sold out show against uh, Lawler and Brad Armstrong came up. But anyway, oh, yeah. yep. then you, drug me, up there and you drug me up there and, and took five minutes with me after beating Bobby Eaton a few years after that and make, made me renege That's on right. my retirement. That's right. That's right. It was funny when I tied your shoestrings together and you got up to run. <laughs> took a bump and I said, that's the most l legitimate looking bump I've ever seen. You said it was. My shoestrings are tied together. <laughs> Hey, well, Brian, I got to tell you this. I got, hold on, Jimmy. Okay. You know, you know I'm, I'm going to tell you something. You know, in the land of professional wrestling, there's potatoes and then there's receipts. <laughs> now, I want everybody to go out online and look those words up if they even talk about it anymore. But now, Brian Lance and the world that's listening, I still to this day owe Jim Cornette a receipt because in that match at Wrestle Reunion, <laughs> he blacked my eyes so big. It look, somebody came up after the match and tried to hang their jacket on that knot on my eye. He hit me so hard, and he said, oh, man, the ropes was loose. You moved. He pushed you towards me, this and that. And you, you, did you forget about that, Jimmy? I no, no, I, I remember. And, and as soon as I believe my exact comment was, oh, my fucking God. Uh, because <laughs> when I punched you directly right square in the eye with all of my knuckles, oh, but oh, no, Jimmy, it, but listen. now here the thing, the ring was the shits and that's another, cause we couldn't have the match that we wanted to have. Cause the ring no. that Sal Corinthi had was the shits <laughs> yeah. and, and it was, the ropes were shaky. And now you will admit, I throw a pretty good punch, you but in throw, this instance, you know what you, 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 you do throw, you do throw one of the better punches in professional wrestling. <laughs> But I'm talking in, about of all the professional wrestlers in the world, in the history, you throw a great punch. But this but was Jimmy, not on that the... night. <laughs> but but on that night, <laughs> that was not one of the best punches. As a matter of fact, you hit me so hard, it almost reminded me wrestling for Mid South Wrestling taking one of Bill Dundee's working punches. Oh, not that hard. No. <laughs> There's no way I could hit. I couldn't hit you that hard. If I, no, I was holding on to that loose rope and I lost my I remember. I the apron and I was in the cheap shot inside and I, I lost my balance. And I, I apologize that for that. But now there now, was the time 
that not only and we've to, we've told the story before the night she set my pants on fire in the locker room while I was yes, wearing, yes 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 but yes. that same night that same night that you did set my pants on fire you also hit me over the head with one of those plastic ringside molded ringside chairs at Washington DC Armory and I just right. went down and laid there instead of powdering and I said do with me what you will because I cannot move after you've hit me so hard over my head with that fucking chair. So, I hope oh, to everybody else as it is to us but I was going to ask you why because I talked to the to the newspaper reporter that covered uh, your last event that I was up there for in Chillicothe, uh-huh. when I was over in Ashland. He came uh-huh. down and brought me. It was a full page article, big spread, pictures, and everything. I heard that. I never got to see it, but I, I heard about that. I signed one for him, and he gave me. I'll make you a copy of the copy that I got. But hmm. uh, but it was a big full page thing. But but he said the only thing was he said your your an acronym, your 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 initials, your world classic professional big. Mm-hmm. Time. W C P B T W. He thought was a little long. For, mm-hmm. And I was just wondering, how did you arrive at the name World Classic Professional Big Time Wrestling? I know, but well, I don't tell the people. Hey, here's here's the deal. You know, for years I grew up watching Big Time Wrestling, the the, the Sheiks. So I promoted for years. You know, even back when Smoky Mountain Wrestling and stuff started, well, I was Big Time Wrestling for years, but. Uh, one guy said, do you mind if I use big time wrestling and this and that? I said, I don't mind. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't realize Jimmy, but back in the fifties and the sixties, every territory, even Dallas, San Francisco, everywhere was big time. wrestling. Everything was, but I had used, yes, everything was big time wrestling. So I had used that for years and no one else had used that. Well, now, uh, a days a lot more, a lot of different people are using it. So I just thought, my goodness, you know, it's world classic. They're professional big time wrestling because Jimmy, they don't even use the term professional wrestling much anymore. They, you well, know, they, they shouldn't. Uh, it would be that. false advertising if they use. Well, it. that's no. true. As a matter of fact, I told my son Dylan, "There's a picture down the road, and it's got it's a it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, a sign, and it's an octagon uh, sign that says workers only." And I went through every backyard in that neighborhood looking for that independent backyard wrestling show. And I couldn't find one anywhere. <laughs> and I went up to the people that was standing there and I said, well, I'm looking for these workers. And they said, well, that's us. We're working for the city. We're cleaning up the streets and stuff. I said, yeah, but you got workers only. I didn't want to walk by that sign because see, I've been a professional wrestler and proud of it for 40 years. And I said, I went through all those backyards. As a matter of fact, I got bit by that dog back over there. They said, we seen that. That was real funny. They said it was even funnier when you got tied up into that rose bush back there. But I looked everywhere, Jimmy, all over. Couldn't workers find the only. workers. I looked all over. I couldn't find the workers only. I looked for them everywhere. I looked for guys in backyards that was back flipping and this and that, wearing a pair of blue jeans and a pair of tennis shoes. And they were workers only, and I couldn't find them. <laughs> and we were talking the other day on the phone, you and I, about how yes. the, the the people who shouldn't be in the wrestling business. Yes, sir. Uh, it's sort of, sort of like I just did a bit on, on the most patriotic people actually in, in the United States are, are the least patriotic. The people now in, <laughs> that shouldn't be in the wrestling business are the ones that use all the terminology. because. Sure. Because we never referred to each other. When it, well, if we came in the locker room, well, I'm here with all the other workers. <laughs> you know? Yes. But now the, <laughs> the guys, to prove that they're smart and they belong in the business and they're with it, they they give yes. you a handshake where they put their first two, two fingers lightly into your fucking palm like that was ever a thing. That's right, brother. And, That's right. Then, and then they say, and I'm a worker. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and they put up signs (laughs) in the locker room workers only in the locker room yes yes yes. and it's just it it's almost like you can almost tell as soon as you walk up well here's another bunch that shouldn't be involved in this business because they go so overboard to to use all the right terms and they call the boys when did it start to be a thing that the boys called each other by their real names instead of their gimmick names never Never. Because it, it has now. 
because it, I I, when I was in, in the Motor City Machine Guns and Brian, and I don't even know if you know their names and I don't even want to reveal them now. It'll spoil the thing. But Chris Saban and Alex Shelley, they used to call <laughs> each other by their real names. When we were in Finnish meetings where there'd be another tag team there and maybe a manager and Alex and Chris, and they'd be calling each other by their real name. I'm like, who the fuck are you people talking about? Yeah, yeah. Did you ever walk it's up just, to Abdullah the Butcher and say, hello, Larry? No, no. And you know what? I still talk to him, and I don't call him Larry. I call him <laughs> Abdullah. I don't even call him Abby. I call him Abdullah. Now, here's the deal. You remember, like, Gypsy Joe wrestled as Aztec Joe? Yeah. Well, And Luis Martinez was Apache Lou and this and that. And when you when he was when he was Luis Martinez, he's Luis Martinez. When he was Apache Lou, guess what everybody called him? Apache Lou. One time when Robert Gibson was breaking into business, Dutch Mantel, I think they were in Kansas City, and I heard this one time, you know, his Reuben, he's Reuben King. Yeah. And very when he first started and Dutch Mantel called him on a promo, Reuben King. As an accident, but he was just becoming Robert Gibson. You know, his brother yeah. was Ricky, Ricky, Ricky Gibson and everything. Uh, but, but we never did. Even, even, even if I met Bugsy McGraw and he was dressed in all green in the back of a dark Columbia Township uh, auditorium stage, how that stage was real dark back there. When I walked up to him, I didn't say, hey, Bugsy. I said, hey, Green Machine. It was just <laughs> yeah. a habit to get into. <laughs> But that's that's just it's it's part of uh, uh, the trend these days that these guys, they put on Twitter on their profiles, wrestler and actor when the only thing they've done was wrestling. And if you're acting when you're a wrestler, you're not doing the wrestling very good. But they they think they're actors. They're playing a part. What would my character do? And they 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 genuinely refer to each other by their real names. And yeah. that, that is, is, like you said, it sets up a bad habit because then you're going to do that in front of an outsider. And then you're sure. going to do that in front of somebody, a reporter for the newspaper or whatever. Not that they care anymore, but it, it's just, it's, that's another reason why. Do you think it's hard for these guys to get in the mindset of what they should be doing to get themselves over? Because they, they believe instead of it, instead of their gimmick being them, they truly believe that they're just playing a part in a character. And that's why they can't get over that's right. And, that, and, and Jimmy, that's not just on the independent level, but that's on the major WWE level as well. Those people aren't who they're portrayed to be. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Jerry the King Lawler was Jerry the King Lawler. Superstar Bill Dundee was Superstar Bill Dundee. That big hat-wearing Dirty Dutch Mantel was Dirty Dutch Mantel. Austin Idol was Austin Idol. And so on and so forth. And you're exactly right uh, about what you're saying. But you see, it's hard for us to try to get it through to them. And the reason why a lot of them has been broke in by guys that has, haven't even hardly left being 40 miles away from home and being trained by them. So it's almost like the first time. The first time, and what I'm talking about in life, that you're with someone else, then they – you never get over that. Well, the first time they train somebody and hear something from them, they think that's the gospel and it's not. And yeah. it's terrible because I was just talking to a guy earlier. There are some guys I know that are very, that are pretty good kind of technically, but they're not sound. And the reason why is their trainer was never sound. And I tried to explain to them, but I can never get through to them. They're on a different level, a different plane different level there is somewhere else and they just can't cross that line to to be really good you know what i'm but saying but hey here's another thing is is they they know it's like when when i was in charge of ovw and i would find baby face and heels for being seen out in public together so they would get the right. message you're not going to shit right. on my business because you're going on somewhere that's else right. i can stay here right that's but right. That's right. When when they get to the big company, and almost none of the big companies anymore, uh, it, nobody mm-hmm. enforces any type of kayfabe mm-hmm. or any type of legitimacy. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they, you know, as as Rip said, you know, when as seen on TV, they think, well, why should I do what these guys said when nobody else is doing it? They don't realize that would just make them stand apart and right. make it over right. a little easier. But it's hard to blame the guys when the the people running the shows are doing the same thing. 
And, you know, even at the top level, not only the independent levels, you know, <laughs> it's a whole nother can of peas. Uh, yeah. WWE, have, have, but the one thing that they share is that nobody believes anything anymore. Well, I'm going to tell you this, Jimmy. I was in Circleville. Sandman was there. He walked from one side across to the other, and a bunch of young guys was in the dressing room where I was at. I looked at him. I said, K Fade. He looked at me. I said, I mean it. <laughs> he looked at me funny again. I said, I mean it. And he turned and walked out. He said, I can't believe it. Yeah, you can <laughs> believe it here because yeah, it takes at, place here. At your shows, the babyface and heel locker rooms are separate. No, there's no yeah. intermingling of the species. <laughs> no, uh, and, and, no. And, and they get their ass chewed if there is because the people can see people going in and out mm-hmm. of the locker room. So you yes, just yes. have a little responsibility, but you, you must have felt like the young kid though. You're an old timer like I am, but you must have felt this past weekend, like the young kid. Cause you were at Scott yes. reunion down in Tennessee. Yes. As a matter of fact, I, I got a chance to go there. I I'm not for sure if it's the last one or not, but I got a chance to go to that reunion that he has of the wrestlers pre 1980. And, uh, when I got there, Jimmy, I walked up into the yard. I seen an empty trailer out in front of Scott's house, and I said, surely there's not a wrestling ring here, is there? Well, hey, it's a wrestling reunion, right, of a bunch of wrestlers. So as I was walking around the corner, the first person I seen was George Weingroff. And I talked to him a minute, and then I walked on around the corner of the house, and there that ring was. And I said, <laughs> my goodness, man, there is a wrestling ring here. So I walked up into the house, and one of the first pre- people, well, I, I kind of looked around and I noticed big Jim Lancaster. I'd seen, as a matter of fact, that his jaw broke by Wild Bull Curry way back in the early 70s on television. I'll never forget Jim, uh, his jaw hanging open and Bob Finnegan or Lord Athelayton was going, I believe Wild Bull Curry has broke Jim Lancaster's jaw. And I'm going to tell you, it looked oh, the way it was hanging funny, like he had <laughs> broke his jaw, but he was sitting there. I seen, uh, I seen, uh, El Bracero, uh, the Supermax, uh, the El Luchador, who had been on uh, the Sheik's Big Time Wrestling. And then I bumped into a guy right off the bat when I walked in the door to a guy I haven't seen since Calgary, Alberta, Canada. His name is Ernie the Lumberjack Lanier. And when I seen him, I said, Ernie, the funny thing of it is, after all these years, you told me in King, North Carolina, way back when, that you got into the ring with an orangutan, a cage. And that it was at the King Fair, like a county fair, and they had like a, a, a big cage, Jimmy, with even on top where that orangutan couldn't get out. And you got to think about it. Way back then, there was no internet, no cable TV. And here this orange orangutan's in this cage taking on all comers. The people or probably Ernie had Lanier. not seen an orangutan at that point no, in time in, in not, person. No, 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 not in person. <laughs> I mean, they probably couldn't even say orangutan. <laughs> look, look at that big monkey over there, you know, orangutan, what? <laughs> but all of a sudden, Ernie up in Calgary, you know, we, we, as a matter of fact, I told, uh, I seen uh, Ronnie Garvin there at the, uh, Scott saying, I said, where we stayed at in uh, Montana, we stayed at the Abe Lincoln Motel. In in the rooms that Lumberjack Lanier and I stayed in was only $5 a night. And it was $5 because there was no bathroom in the room. You had to walk way down the hall. It was like the old Wild West Hotel. You know what I'm saying. And use the bathroom down there. Everybody used the same shower, the same, uh, you know, bathroom. Yeah. And, and everything, but because it was Montana, uh, he, yeah, my Montana up in Butte or Billings, Great Falls. We were wrestling for Stu Hart. We'd go down into Montana. So all of a sudden, uh, he's telling me about getting in that cage with that orangutan uh, years ago, where he had to put on a coverall, and the whole town's watching. He crawled in there. He's six foot four, and he gets beat about half to death. He tried to grab that orangutan, this and that, and everything. Well, the funny so the, the, ora- the orangutan oh, couldn't work. It just it was. Oh was... no! He jumped up on the. He would jump up on top and hold on with one hand. It wasn't a working. It wasn't a workers only orangutan. 
<laughs> this was for R E A L. You understand what I'm saying? <sighs> and taking on all comers. So so that, that orangutan would jump up on the top of that cage and he took Ernie Lanier and he beat him with two feet in the other hand and just beat him all in. You, you could imagine what the crowd was thinking. Well, you, <laughs> that was in 1980. I heard the story. So in about 19, that would have to be the, that would, he would have to be the only person that I would ever know or ever have run into that would have actually have wrestled an orangutan. Yes. Yes. Except for when Clint Eastwood had that monkey running around with him. Remember yes. right, right yeah. turn Clyde. Remember that? Yes, it, right. yes. Well, then, then, and then I met another guy named Talmadge Williams who has passed away, who became a good friend of mine. And he said, you know, I never got into professional wrestling or anything. As a matter of fact, he was a big prison guard. He was about six foot four, 300 pounds. He said, but I did in King, North Carolina. I fought an orangutan. What? And I, <laughs> you met another I thought, guy what? that fought an Another guy. Another guy. Now, Jimmy, listen, he told me he got all liquored up and he wanted to be his. I don't know if he was before Ernie or after Ernie or if he made that monkey mad when Ernie got in there. But, but, but what happened was my friend Talmadge got into the, got into the orangutan's cage, he told me, and he made him put on coverall. He said he got in there. And that orangutan was mad, and Talmadge was drunk, you know, uh, drinking. <laughs> and he looked, and the crowd's going nuts. And he went to hit that orangutan, and that orangutan grabbed a hold of Tat in front of the crowd, ripped his coveralls off, <laughs> and beat him about half to death. Then he would crap in his hand and throw it all over him, you know. And I'm sure he did that to Ernie, too. You know, here's the whole county watching. That insult to injury. the cage. With a monkey, now you're totally naked, <laughs> screaming for help, <laughs> and you only get you only get three minutes. But probably after about thirty five seconds, you're begging to open up the door. You know, it's about like getting on a ride somewhere, going, "Oh man, give me off this ride!" No, you got to finish it. Well, needless to say, Talmadge was and, beat and, and naked. Of all things, of all things, to actually have to suffer the indignity of then having the monkey poo flung on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> Jimmy, you know, for and Talmadge told me he said it was horrible, but he was drunk. But it was one of the things when he got sober that he wished he'd have forgot, but he couldn't get it out of his head, and it could have been the black and blue marks all over him of what in the world had got a hold of me, right? So, so you have I'm, met two people in your life that have wrestled an orangutan. Two people at the King Fair. But now, you know, a lot of people don't realize this. Some, some people do. From about 1991 or two, I started promoting the Tough Man competitions throughout North and South Carolina. And I put out my poster, Reward Wanted the Toughest and Baddest Man, right? Well, I was up in Jefferson. And you didn't I call any. You didn't call any of them the King of the Mountain tournament, did you? Uh uh-uh, uh uh uh. Oh yeah, that was a different uh-uh. guy that sued me then. Never, never mind. Go ahead. Did a guy call call him the King of the Mountain? Oh, and we've already Did told you? that story earlier in the program. But okay. yeah, th- thanks well, to Rob Moore in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, that King of the Mountain match, the, the tough man people sued me over that. <laughs> you're kidding me. Well, he tried to. I just, I sent him a nasty letter. I got you. I got you. Well, hey, they always do. But, hey, what I was getting ready to tell you was there's a, you know how, like, in these small towns, there's, like, a gathering place in the town. And I took that poster. I said, do you all mind if I put this poster up in your window? To some old farmer about 85 years old, he looked at that poster, and he said, I'll never forget many, many years ago. Right here in Jefferson, Ash County, they brought a monkey in here was taking on all comers. He said, and we had a woman that lived up here by the name of Mary who kept her hair cut real short, <laughs> smoked a cigar, and she carried like a hundred pound bale of tobacco or something on her shoulder like it was nothing. So I'm visualizing when Jimmy, when people talk, I start visualizing. Yeah. So I'm thinking of Mary smoking a cigar, short hair. That could mean that Mary could be May Young. <laughs> May Young. May Young. 
could, and could have maybe never have been with a man. I'm not saying all cigar smoking women are that way, but we got to be careful the way we describe things today. But short hair over the year, yeah, cigar it, it, smoking. She's probably playing for the other team. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Jimmy. There you go. Well, he said, I'll never forget it. It was like it was yesterday. This guy's 85 years old, right? He said, Mary got in there to fight that orangutan. And he just put his head down and started shaking his head. <laughs> now, I'm visualizing what happened after. The whole county's watching Mary and the orangutan. <laughs> Mary probably got her got her coveralls ripped off of her. Maybe that orangutan had been the first time he had been around the woman in a long time. So Mary probably didn't get beat up with fists or anything like oh, that. Oh, now, and now probably... we, can't, we can't speculate on these type of things. Whether that... <laughs> but Jimmy, <laughs> whether Jimmy, Mary listen to me. Raped by the orangutan. <laughs> we don't. Do what now? As whether Mary was raped or not by the orangutan, we certainly can't speculate. But there was well, probably. Hold it. I got to tell thing. you what the farm, what the man said afterwards. He said afterwards that mary left town with that orangutan <laughs> and they were happily ever after <laughs> you didn't let me finish telling your story mary was gone she left mary ash county gone. and never went back again back again was was interspecies marriage legal back in ash county in those days <laughs> did they have to live in sin <laughs> I don't know. You, I don't know. Have you, <laughs> this is just gone south. Have you ever wrestled? A, did you ever wrestle the bear? Yes, quite a few times. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I wrestled the, I, the first, one of the first couple matches I wrestled up in West Virginia. They had a bear, but they didn't wrestle him. But years later, Tuffy, Tuffy Truesdale had a bear that went around, and Nick Adams used to bring the bear around, right? Nick Adams had gentleman Ben, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, we were up in we were up in, uh, in Kentucky, and Dale Mann brought the bear in to work or to wrestle. So we're in there fighting ourselves to death. I mean, my hands are black and blue because it had a muzzle on it, but for some reason, my hands kept going in his mouth, fighting for my life, and he just stuck on them because he didn't have <laughs> any teeth. So we're fighting him every night. And then all of a sudden, I look over and that Nick Adams would grab that bear and that bear would reach up and th give him a working snap mare. Yeah. Then the bear would give him a monkey flip and this and that. Well, finally, Dale Mann, the late Dale Mann, who just passed away, and uh, he, had, uh, he had met up with the bear man's wife one evening. And she told all the secrets to Dale Mann of how to grab that bear in certain sections. Now, wait a minute. But when you say met night, up, with, met up with the bear man's wife, what, what, well, well, you mean well, sort of, sort of like Mary and the orangutan met up? Yeah, 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 yeah. But it was like in Glasgow, Kentucky. It's almost like it was yesterday. And we were staying in one of them hotels back in. It was like a motor inn where it was all on one or two levels. And yeah. they had a little diner in there. You remember, you know, those types. Well, I'll never forget what was in there that night. And Nick Adams had a pistol. And me and Joe Cagle and Mike Dupree, he came in. He said, I'm looking for my wife. And he had a pistol on him, right? And this was the night the secrets were found out. So we knew what Dale, room Dale Mann was in. We called him, said, said Dale, you better watch it. Said, uh, we don't know if his wife's in that room with you or not spilling her guts out, telling them secrets. But he's got a pistol. And he was, here's what he did. We caught him. You know how like there'll be a small little ledge, like it was one level in the front, but two levels in the back. Yes. Yeah. Because of the way the hill went. Yeah. He, that bear, that bear man was crawling on that ledge with that pistol in his hand, looking through windows. As he <laughs> <laughs> did he ever find Dale man? No, Dale Man lived till just about two or three months ago. And <laughs> Dale Man came out and told us everything he found out about uh, Nick Adams' wife then. I mean, you know, and I mean, I didn't mean to tell all that internationally, but just to tell the story that there, 
that not unlike hey, these independent minute, Brian, wrestlers can you, today, can you make, no, just just make this a domestic podcast. We don't want to tell this internet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can we have an inner county, maybe just King, North Carolina or something? And ask County, can you <laughs> So well, now, let me ask you this. Now Bob Eaton told me this. And, and I mm-hmm. want to know if this is true from another veteran bear wrestler that if you, if the bear was being yeah. stiff with you, you got stiff with the bear that he would lighten up like it. Cause he said one time the bear was just taking out muzzle and just hitting him in the ribs and bam, like yeah. a, a nut muzzle butt, right? Boom, boom. Yeah. And yeah. he said, he just drew back and punched the bear in between the eyes as hard as he possibly could. And the bear <laughs> didn't sell it, but he just looked at him and kind of loosened up on the lockup. Yeah. Just, yeah. Cause he was. <laughs> Well, see, now that bear was Rip Tyler's bear that Bobby wrestled, no doubt, with Nick Gould. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember, I remember Rip Tyler from Georgia. Do you remember that name, Jimmy? Oh, yeah, Rip Tyler, yes. He, yeah. I don't know, but Wahoo McDaniel, they fella. said, he, huh? What kind of a pug-faced fellow. Yeah, yeah, Rip Tyler, what? yeah. He, uh, but, but, but people told me that Wahoo McDaniel slapped that bear one time in Cleveland or somewhere. Years ago, and and that bear hit Wahoo so hard it knocked him about five rows into ringside. <laughs> so Wahoo was trying to chop the bear. <laughs> yeah, he hit him. He hit him hard. He hit him hard, and he knocked that that bear knocked Wahoo McDaniel about five rows into ringside. So Rip Tyler's bear, I'm gonna be honest with you, was a little sick. Rip didn't like to feed it much. Oh, so no. I'm sure that I'm sure that Bobby, when Bobby hit that bear, that bear was that bear. He didn't have much fight in him anyway. <laughs> well, that you know that's a th- oh, God, that's a thing that a lot of the guys used to do in those old days when they would they, generally the manager. And I never had to do this. I was after the bear era, but the, the manager in the old days or some heel with heat would have to right. rest the bear <clears right. <clears <throat> and the baby faces would go up to it beforehand when it was in the cage. Like they brought the trailer that had the cage and everything and they'd poke it with sticks and everything to make it mad. Oh, to fuck yeah. with the fucking manager. And you know, <laughs> I, I don't know if I would have ever, have, uh, I would have left the bear wrestling to other, other people. Well, this guy that I seen the first time on Ken Jugan's show up in West Virginia, when I, first broke in that guy sat in the back and it was the days when they said you eat honey for energy well he just broke into business he's back there eating honey and he's getting ready to wrestle a bear <laughs> and i thought now why in the world would you do that then he complained afterwards what well, bear was trying to eat me alive <laughs> you know they, they brought the Christmas week was the big week for the bear in, in, in right. Tennessee territory. Right. And they brought the bear in one Christmas when my aunt Lola was down visiting us and she went to the matches with us. Cause we had an extra street, extra street, extra seat <clears throat> at ringside where one of the regular people was out of town. Anyway, we didn't tell her about the, I didn't think tell her about the bear, right? I had the card there in my notebook is before I started yep. taking pictures, but I'm on the front row of my notebook and everything. And she's talking to my mom, and all of a sudden, here comes Nick Adams and Gentleman Ben down the aisle. He's leading Gentleman Ben by yes, that sir. chain. And yes, sir. When my aunt turned around and saw that bear coming down the aisle, <laughs> she got up and took off. And we had to run after her. They get the bear in the ring. And we got her to come back and sit down on her seat. And in those days in Kentucky... Every place mm-hmm. they didn't have to do this, but in Kentucky, you had to wind chicken wire around the ring. It had to be some kind of cage protecting, right? Really? Sometimes, they, oh yeah, in Kentucky, but sometimes they just had the bear in the ring, and that was it, right? <laughs> so anyway, yeah. they they had wound the, the they wound the chicken wire around, right? And they start having the match. This with Jimmy Kent, the bounty hunter's manager, right? And apparently, that bear was. It, it, I've understood that sometimes the bear, when it's uh, when it's the wrong time of the month or when they're supposed to be yeah. hibernating or whatever yeah. the case may be, they get grumpy. So yeah. that bear in the middle of all the routine and Jimmy Kent's taking the snap mare and everything. And he gets bear pawed yeah. and flies into the corner and all that he stuff. He must have met Nick's wife. Well, there you go. <laughs> the bear, the bear all of a sudden got pissed and kind of <laughs> stood up on its hind legs and reared over on the chicken wire over the ropes and looked like it was coming over the top rope. And we You're looked around. Me. 
It, it, it looked like it was going to come over, but it didn't. But it bowed that chicken wire down, <laughs> sort of like the cage matches they had in Tennessee at the time yeah. where they'd use chicken wire. And the guys would take a bump and it just bit them out. We looked over and my Aunt Lola was all the way out of ringside running. And the guy, the guy sitting next to her in the seat was running right behind her. <laughs> <laughs> and they got the match finished, and, and then he, the bear drank the coke, set up on his hind legs, and drank the coke out, sure. of the, out of the bottle, and did all the stuff the kids like. And and then Aunt Lola came back. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to have the bear in Smoky Mountain as a mystery partner, right? And that would have been great. Well, it was gonna be. Here's it, it was actually it was right before we went out of business, and this could have possibly fucking stalled that off a little bit, but. When when Riggy Morton and, and Tracy Smothers' uh, various uh, other halves had had the issue and right and he had left the territory for a while and all that stuff, but anyway, we had it was going to be Robert Gibson who had t- t- switched heel and the heavily bodies and a six man against Tracy Smothers, Tony Anthony. And a mystery partner. And I was going to sign the contract and say they could get any partner they wanted. And then they were going to show the video. We were going to go out <laughs> in the woods. And they were going to find a bear, right? And bring them back. Yeah. Oh, that would have been great. Do you know that it was, I called the bear guy in Georgia. It was illegal at that time to have bears wrestle in Tennessee in 1995. Yeah. They've yeah. just ruined everything. It, I'm it's t- that it, way, you know. I could have cut a promo. I'm just saying I could have cut a promo (laughs) where if people thought that these three guys and me were going to have to fight two guys and a fucking bear, we could have drawn a fucking Mm -hmm. ass. I'm just telling you. You could have put an Alka-Seltzer in that bear's mouth and it could have been throbbing at the mouth. (laughs) Oh, hey, Jimmy. I, I swear to God, that's another thing, uh, I, it, it just uh, apropos of nothing, but when you mentioned the Alka-Seltzer, where was it yes. the last time that I told somebody, I can't remember if it was an OVW or a Ring of Honor or whatever, I said, somebody go get an Alka-Seltzer and would do the fucking mm-hmm. throat thing, and they all looked at me like I had turds hanging out of my mouth. And yeah, I had, they don't know, they don't know. You know, fucking shot to the throat, you've got to pop the Alka-Seltzer, your foam. Well, yeah, then they yeah, put yeah. the goddamn thing, and it just... <laughs> It looked like a goddamn fire extinguisher. It just, <laughs> and it just, it's, and they don't know how to break the bottles and things and such. Mm-mm. Um, Mm-mm. is it you so? Know, hey, I want to just, I want to just say this real quick. In my hometown, Chillicothe, Ohio, right over here on Water Street, they used to have a place called the Winter Garden. It was a skating rink, ice skating rink, and they had wrestling and boxing there in the 30s and 40s and stuff. Well, I met some people the other day. They talked about when they went, there was an alligator wrestling. Oh, yes. As a this matter of fact. was way back in. In the ahead. 40s, there was a guy. As a matter of fact, the alligator wrestled in, in Louisville, too, in the 40s. Yep. And through like over well, 7,000 people. Here's what happened here in Chillicothe. The alligator, like you talked about how the bear got out of the thing. The out, back then, think about it, the 40s, they didn't see stuff like that every day. Well, the alligator that came here, when he crawled, when he got out of the ring and started heading towards the crowd, the policeman pulled his pistol out and shot and killed him. <laughs> but the rest of the matches. God damn. <laughs> well, <laughs> did they refund the people's money? <laughs> well, no, man. <laughs> he, got, he had wrestled. But what oh, he already wrestled. He went out. Okay. He's already wrestled. You know, they, but here's the deal, Jimmy. Well, at least then, they got the match in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, Jim, Sam Metnicker, who had talked Stu Hart into buying an airplane and then stole Stu Hart's airplane, you know about that story, yeah. right? Well, he didn't steal it. He just talked Stu into buying one and then he gave it yeah. and flew it to the next territory. Yeah. Stu, well, what Stu happened? Could have gone to El Paso and picked it up if he'd wanted to. Yeah. But, but, but what happened? They were wrestling in Alaska, and they took that alligator in that airplane, another alligator over there to wrestle. Well, the alligator froze to death on the way to Alaska. Now they're advertised, the alligator's going to wrestle. And they got a dead alligator, and they got all this crowd of people, and they thought, what are we going to do? So they had someone drag that dead alligator out to the ring. And then that guy dove on him like a Tarzan movie, rolled all over with him and did everything they could. To, <laughs> gave him a match and 
rolled all around the ring and this and that. And with a dead alligator. <laughs> with a dead alligator, yes, sir. The show must go on, Jimmy. Hey, sp- sp- speaking of the show going on, I remember it like it was just yesterday. It was 1982. We've been talking, This is my 35th anniversary. You beat me by a couple right. of years. You were a teenage yep. prodigy. But it, 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 35 years ago, I remember when I was just a young rookie manager that you were a young white meat baby face in the Memphis yes, territory. Sir. And you were, and, and your job in the tag team matches was to, to sell and get yes. some sympathy and then give the, the yes. hot tag to the, the veteran top superstar that was, that was drawing yes. all the money, who was Bill Dundee. <laughs> and, yes. and you performed that same role again this past Saturday night. Did you not in Nashville, yes. Tennessee? Yes. Yes, we did. As a matter of fact, like I said, I got down there. I, I went to Scott Teal's, got to see people like Tony Falk, Mike Dupree. As a matter of fact, I got to listen to this. Brian Lass, can you hear me? I can hear you. He can hear you. Yes, yes, he's, he's, he's there. Chris Parsons brought the tag team belts that the Hells Angels brought from Arizona to Detroit's Big Time Wrestling and then later on to the W, to Dick the Bruiser's territory, brought those belts so I could get me a picture taken with them and hold those particular belts. As a matter of fact, you can see them belts, those belts on YouTube when it's the Hells Angels, Chris Colt, Ron Dupree against uh, JJ against Dillon Jim, and Arnold Jim Dillon and yeah. Arnold yeah. Colden. Well, you those can see them on, on those, them. those Indianapolis tapes from the early 70s. That's yes. the belts they were using then, the, the, the rectangular yes, silver plates with the gold uh, Zabadas. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Well, and as a matter of fact, I got a chance to see Nick Kozak was Jerry with there was brother Jerry Kozak wrestled. I got a chance to see um uh, get Mike Pappas. Do you remember Mike Pappas, Jimmy? The Flying Greek. The Greek. The Flying Greek. As a matter of fact, I said I remember in the early seventies the picture of him and Andre the Giant standing <laughs> together because yes. Mike Pappas wrestled for the WWF. Yeah. And he told me that Vince McMahon Sr. wanted that photo of Andre and Mike together. It was a big publicity picture, you know, well, for yeah, them and everything. You, you know why he wanted Because Mike was the only wrestler he had that was five foot five. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> I've got that same picture, that centerfold from the magazine. It's uh, autographed That's by right. on my wall here. But Well, you need to, you need to then get Mike to autograph it and then you'll have both guys well if you'd have told me you were going i would have i would have had you carry it down there and but yeah he's been a jeweler i guess for i got it in springfield yes for years now right yeah you got his number maybe we we can get some some discount jewelry and he sells the good stuff not the plowboy frazier stuff too right that's exactly right yes sir he does sell top quality (laughs) stuff as a matter of fact he that rings there at that Scott Teal's thing, and Scott told me later, he said, you'll be surprised, Bobby, of the guys. I got in the ring. I made Pat Rose get in the ring and roll around with me a little bit. He tried to get Tony Falk, too, and he said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, but I made Pat Rose do it, and Pat Rose tied me up into the ropes, Jimmy. When was the last time you seen that in wrestling? You know, uh, where your arms are tied up into the yeah. ropes. Do you remember how... Years well, yeah, ago. Well, well, Cactus Jack kind of put the kibosh on that when he tied his head up in it and his ear came he off. Cut his ear we off. talked about yeah, that a couple yeah. of weeks ago here, but it- <laughs> yeah, right, right. But but I've seen a lot of great guys. But like you said, a guy that I owe a lot to my career to, uh, superstar Bill Dundee. Me and him, we tag teamed up, and uh, you're right, they beat the crap out of me. <laughs> and then I seen Bill Dundee throwing those working punches, and I could hear it on the end of those guys' chins. <laughs> And they were trying to fall, but they couldn't because he would throw right, left, right, yeah. left. <laughs> he well, he hit me was, one time with one of those, and I tried to fall down to take a bump for him, but I couldn't figure out which way to go. After he, <laughs> I was like, "Wait, where is down? I can't." You know, you, you know, he told me this. He said years ago when me and him was wrestling him and Dirty Dutch down there in Louisiana, Bill and them was beating me with a bull whip, mur- just unbelievable. He said a fan jumped in the ring one night, and Bill took that bull whip. And he was beating me at the handle and hit that fan in the face with it. And that fan looked at Bill and said, I guess I better get out of here. And he threw himself out of the ring. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> well, at least he made the right decision. But if so, but yes, so did. did you? Did you got you guys won the match? Of course. Yes, we won the match. As a matter Thanks of fact, thanks to Bill uh, tagging in and straightening everything out after you you yes, put him in jeopardy. Did, yes, yes, that's exactly right. If it wouldn't have been for Bill and I wasn't able to get over there and crawl to make that tag, we would have never. We'd have still probably been wrestling today. About three or four days later, we wrestled some tough guys. As a matter of fact, uh, and Bill, Bill, we just brought him up to Ohio not long ago, and the crowd's chanting, "He still got it." Now he's. 70 something years young and he's like the dick clark of wrestling to me i mean you know what i'm saying think about it i think that's i think ricky morton is the dick clark of wrestling bill dundee is is the the tom jones or engelbert humperdinck of wrestling i like that i like that analogy now let me ask you this jimmy how many guys have you ever seen get up on the top rope of the loppy floppy ropes and run around that ring. Like Bill Dundee would do the oh, top uh, rope. It was, it was ridiculous on those spot shows. And that, that was the thing Dundee in all seriousness was able to adapt his match. If he was in the Memphis mid South Coliseum, then he had a serious main event match with a lot of action and big bumps and excitement, whatever. But if he was in a spot show, it would oh, be yeah. it would be equally as entertaining, but it would be and and basically the heels would still get their ass kicked, but it would be much less dangerous, and yeah. and and more entertaining for the the school you know kids and the people. Sure. Are, but he'd get in those spot shows. He'd he'd get up on the top rope and and he on one turnbuckle and he'd do a tight rope walk to the other turnbuckle and jump off with a <laughs> double sledge. <laughs> And then he'd go yeah. into the ring and he'd find the broom that the ring crew left and he'd come out and he'd chase the manager with it. And he'd be tie my shoelaces together or he'd pull the manager's <laughs> pants down and he'd back in the ring, give the heels some more bumps. <laughs> and he'd be out there 20 or 30 minutes and the people were screaming the whole way. And, but yeah. no one would ever get hurt. No. And, and, no. and, and no. still people would take it all completely seriously and yes, it was sir. heels were the butt of the jokes, and and then there and then right. he'd sell and get some heat on the heel. Yes, he would sell, so then he could make a big comeback and beat him up again. And that worked for years. <laughs> That's and years. Exactly. It was unbelievable, you know, Jimmy. When we before the day of the music, the music entrances, I would watch him and Jerry Lawler walk out to the ring, and it was just magical. And a lot of the guys back then, of course, I was wrestling underneath and everything i'd have my match and go get a take a shower that's something that guys don't do anymore after a wrestling match take a shower well look but, at some uh, look at some of the places that they're wrestling in <laughs> the shower know, would be preferable just wander into a creek on the way home but you know yeah, <laughs> but you know uh, a lot of times we would carry alcohol with us not drinking but rubbing <laughs> alcohol to take a shower especially nick gulas territory because we was talking about that bear earlier wrestling with Rip Tyler, yeah. it had gave everybody Infantago, and people was having Infantago. The wrestlers was, and you oh, remember Infantago? Yeah, it's kind of a skin rot type of thing. Yeah, that's that's, yeah. and that was because that bear and the bear pee, and then the, <laughs> we wrestled in the same ring, and you know what I'm saying, rolling around there. You know, what do, hey, what do you think? What do you see? think? In in those days, the canvases were cleaned. What once every year or two, maybe. Or they just got a hole in them and they, they get a, for, yeah, like Louisville, Nashville, Memphis. Yeah. Uh, they they used to they like got a hole in them, then they got a new one. They never cleaned them on purpose. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, the blood would just, you'd see the blood from from uh, back in the 60s on it. You yeah. know, there's blood spots all in the ring. But, hey, another guy I seen was Jerry Barber. Jerry Barber I yes. seen at uh, Scott Till's uh, thing. And, and the funny thing of it was, he said, I think I remember you. But he was a guy who had a chain. I had a chain. Me and Eric Embry's Bob and Don Fulton was in a stretcher death match or something. And I took that chain, and he had a cut on his head, and he was bleeding like a stuck hog. And I rubbed that chain all in that cut real good, <laughs> just grinded it in there. And the next day, he came to that show. And, you know, back then, the hills was on one side, big face on the other. He was doing everything he could to get to me to try to kill me. Because <laughs> look what you've done to me, you stupid idiot. I'll kill you. His head was, he looked like a unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Jimmy. He got, in, he got infected. 
is what he yeah, got infected. He got that Invitago or that staff. <laughs> but Jimmy, I just said, yes, I remember meeting you, sir. And it's good seeing you today. I didn't bring that up. I didn't want to wreck it. He'd have probably murdered me there at Scott Till's reunion. He's been waiting all them years to get a hold of me, you know. Hey, what one before we go, one more thing I gotta ask you about. Cause we mentioned the 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 man himself, the man, the myth, the legend, Wild Bull Curry. You were a yes, huge sir. fan uh yes. when you when you were a kid, but they, they just had they somebody just put out some video, and I'm trying to think, Brian, were you tagged in on this? A video of Bull Curry doing a TV match when he was like 61 or whatever. And and was that and, one Luis Martinez? Um, yes, there's yeah, two. Yeah. It's two from the same taping, right. and uh, Louis Martinez is one of them, and then the other one's just and he's going man. die, die, <laughs> die, <laughs> die. <laughs> die, <laughs> die <laughs> the the die. thing is, you you can kind of see the flashes of what he was because he he was a, a boxer and then a wrestler, and he wrestled for like mm-hmm. till and, and a main events level. He was used mm-hmm. and based on how over he was from his years as a top sure. wrestler. He was used as a main event guy until he was well into his 60s. And sure. but it's a, the, thanks to the miracle of hair dye, he really sure. never looked any different because he looked like a beast from, you know, another world, the wild man from sure. Rio or whatever anyway, with the sure. eyebrows and the hair all over his sure. body. But that match, he's 60 years old, and you can say, and, it, and, and if you didn't know who Bull Curry was and you didn't experience yeah. that, then you could see, yes, this does in some ways look like an old man, but you could still see in yeah. some ways that his shit looked more believable and was simpler than a lot of guys today. But he, I guess he didn't, he never had a peak physically because I, he never really did anything differently he just went out there and no. was crazy and fought people and threw the you know greatest punches in the world right but right. that um that tape from houston in the 60s with, yes, with johnny, johnny valentine, valentine that was going around before that's the kind of stuff you guys got to see that was up in ohio and michigan when you were kids yes. valentine and curry and eagle yes. and you know Sheik and abdullah and all that stuff but while bull curry it was he was a main event guy in what six different decades. Yes, yes, he was. And as a matter of fact, Jimmy, I wrestled him when I was sixteen and seventeen years old, eighteen, before I left home, graduated high school with Flying Fred Curry. It would be me, Jerry Graham Jr., uh, uh, or Mad Dog Zarnoff, a guy named Bob Hamby. We would wrestle Wild Bull and Flying Fred Curry. Now, here's the deal. Looking back on it now, we're more educated. It's just like, for example, when you seen Eddie Marlin, Eddie Marlin never spent any time. A lot of the guys never did. Uh, you know, it's just like some UFC guys you see. Some of them don't look like they've been in a gym. They're yeah. wiry type guys. But now, since we have that mentality of bodybuilders, this and that, it it it, it heightens the awareness of Bull Curry and, and where he was in his time to us. But to see him back in the 70s, and I wrestled him, and I'll never forget, and I've shared this story in Portsmouth, Ohio. One night on a Thanksgiving night, he picked up a chair and hit me with it, and there was probably four or 500 people there, and everybody picked up their chairs and started throwing it at me. And I'm laying on the floor of this building, and Fred Curry and Bull Curry standing in the ring, and the crowd's all up by the r- ring, slapping that ring, because, you know, back then you could get to the ring. Yeah. There was no barriers. And the people was going nuts because see, flying Fred Curry, just like you talked about, we got the heat on him and there's wild bull Curry standing in that corner. And then people knew when that man gets in, he's going to kill these guys. And that's exactly the big eyebrows, the hair and this and that. And, uh, it was just a magical, unbelievable, you know, I'm going to come up uh, upcoming. I'm going to try to get a match wrestling Nick Curry who has been an amateur great wrestler who's just breaking in, but hopefully Flying Fred will come to Ohio, bring Nick Curry, because I'd love the opportunity to have wrestled Wild Bull Curry, Flying Fred Curry, and then would have wrestled, uh, will wrestle uh, Nick Curry coming three up. Gen- so, three generations of Currys. Amazing, amazing, and they were magical. But you know what, Jimmy? People just, we, we talk about being magical and like the Currys, and you talked about Igor the Sheik and, Pamper Furpo, and then for you, it was it was uh, Jerry Lawler, Jackie the Fargo, Fargos, Tojo, yeah. Jerry Jarrett, all these guys. It was magical, and then and then the Carolinas, Johnny Weaver, uh, uh, George Becker. You know, people still talk about 
George Becker. I was just somewhere the other day, and people was talking about Johnny Weaver and George Becker. Talk about George and Sandy Scott wrestling. I mean, it's amazing that after all these years, people are still talking about that. And it's just like I tell my son Dylan all the time. I said, Dylan, people's not talking about what's going on Monday night or Tuesday night. Why do you think they'll talk about it 20 years from now or 10 <laughs> years from now if they're and, not talking know, about it now? It's sad to say, but that's uh, oftentimes I will sit and wonder, uh, you know, when we talk about this great match that we saw 40 years ago that we'll never yes. forget or the promo or whatever, is that, you know, is there even going to be anything to talk about until then? No, but, uh, it, it's no. And by the way, one more thing before I go, as Lawler once said in a promo, I had forgotten completely about this, but I was doing it on my 35th anniversary. I was doing an article, mm -hmm. Fighting Spirit Magazine, doing some research. I had forgotten mm -hmm. that technically I managed you in 1983. Yes. As the Galax the replacement yes. Galaxian. VHS yes, the Galaxian. <laughs> <laughs> because yes. it, was, it was Danny Davis and Ken Wayne were Alpha and Beta the Galaxians because Lawler had the right. suits made and you know and, and, right. and wanted the tag team. And when Danny Davis got his back hurt in Louisville at the Gardens, he was out for like three or four months. His worst injury right. he ever had. Uh, since you fit the suit and greatly resembled sure. physically Danny Davis, uh, yes. the Galaxians became <laughs> Alpha Bobby and v Foley. or Beta and VHS or whatever. <laughs> um, Yes, it sir. Bobby Fulton for about a week, and I'd forgotten about that. Yes, oh, yes, yes. You forgot about that, Jimmy. Not to mention that we were we we had already been uh, we drove uh, made the trip from Louisville to Evansville. You would uh, come stay and remember remember Pizza Transit Authority. Oh God, yeah, that was I in Dallas. That it was in Dallas. One of the best pizzas we ever ate. Yeah, but Brian, here's the thing. Uh, it was PTA, Pizza Transit Authority. Me yes. and Bobby had apartments in Irving. And <laughs> and I went nuts with the idea that they would bring the food to my door. And and I'd been in Louisiana, so delivery was right. one thing few and far between. And then you didn't want the delivery people to know where you live because they could come back later on and cut your tires. Because we were right. So I never had anything delivered right. to my house. But in, in Dallas, I felt a level of safety. And I think at one time, Bobby Eaton walked in to pick me up for a trip, Bobby. And I had like 12 or 13 pizza boxes strewn all over the place from the previous 12 or 13 nights. Dinner. And he said, Corey, I like your carpet. You got that. But, uh, but yeah, That's where were we going with that? Where were we going with that? Where were we going? Where were we going where? No, we were just know. talking, you know, <laughs> look here. We were just talking about different things, and all of a sudden that came out of left field there. <laughs> well, here's what it was. Because when I was coming back through Nashville this past weekend, yes. I called you up. I said, Jimmy, on Sunday, let's me and you meet for lunch. And you said, fine. Well, then that night I had to call you because when I was wrestling for that company, that guy that was real wooly, real hairy, and uh, as a matter of fact, I think he was Sasquatch because he smelled like him too. He said, Hey, I'm not, well, we're not going to put you in a hotel. You're going to go home with me. I said, really? He said, yeah, I told my wife that I was going to bring you home. You're going to sleep in another room. Oh, I said, for well, God's years ago, I said, years ago, sir, you would have slept in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> and some woman was sitting there about 55 or maybe 60. And she's sitting there by me and Bill Dundee, and she said, you know what? That's right. I remember those days. <laughs> well, anyway, that's another thing. You, you cheated me out of lunch on Sunday because you called me Saturday yes. night. I'm watching yes. Spinguli. I'm curled up on the couch. I've nodded off. And you called, well, it's not going to be tomorrow. I'm coming through in about an hour. I said, well, fuck you. I'm asleep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you owe me lunch. Well, you know what? Me and you had FaceTimed at that time. And you're curled up in your recliner. You had a Sprite snuggled up next to you, and you're sucking your thumb, and you still had your glasses on. Hey, I wasn't a thumb. I'll have you. <laughs> All right. Hey. So it's about time for us to not do this program anymore. Brian, <laughs> do you have anything you'd like to close with? Uh, congratulations on 200 episodes, Jim. Well, there you go. And thank you, Bobby, for being our guest on the 200th episode and final episode, probably, of the Jim Cornette experience. Final. Uh, after this, where, where are you going to go? It's only only one way to go is down from here. Ladies and gentlemen, 
until <laughs> next week. And when we'll talk about more bears, orangutans, and monkeys. Oh, my. Alligators. Uh, and alligators, too. It's it's the wild kingdom here, folks. For, while Jim stays in the truck, for Marlon Perkins and, <laughs> and Bobby Fulton, I'm Jim Cornette. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye. <laughs>